questions. Um, thank you very much for your patience and for waiting a few minutes. Uh, I'm pleased to join Dr. Amar tonight to uh, give us insight into the effective methods of irrigation in endontics. Uh, Dr. Amar is a, uh, an uh, endodontic practitioner who finished his training in Liverpool Dental Hospital last year and um, he's working he's with a few practices as limiting his practice to endodontics uh, in uh, North London and also in the suburbs of London in the area of Richmond. He's very passionate about teaching about endodontics. He's, uh, I knew Amar for a couple of years now. He's uh, very keen to teach uh, to uh, actually to transfer his skills to the junior colleagues and to the people who are passionate about endodontics. Um, uh, Amar finishes in dentistry in Glasgow uh, um, a few years back, and he did some few rotation training in Northwest England as well, in maxillofacial and in restorative dentistry. Without any further ado, I'd like Dr. Amar to um, start to introduce himself briefly as well and to start his session, and I'm sure all of us will enjoy his talk as uh, he's a very good speaker and he will hopefully will impress all of us with his tips and trips. Thank you very much, Amar. <clears throat> Thanks so much, um, Dr. Shahab, for your introduction. Uh, yeah, I graduated from Glasgow in 2009. Um, and like you said, I did uh, multiple SHO jobs. Um, and then I worked as a general dental practitioner for two to three years. Um, I then worked in MaxFax for a couple of years. Um, and that's when I realized I wanted to become um, an endontist. So I did my three year endodontic program at Liverpool with my doctorate in endontology. My, I actually um, did my doctorate on trauma. Um, and um, since then, I've been able to teach on sem you know, uh, various uh, seminars across the UK. Um, and it gives me great pleasure to be um, able to do this with Dr. Shab in the London Dental Academy, which is a very prestigious academy. Um, so I want to talk about uh, endontic irrigation. The reason why I, I like this topic is because I don't think it gets the attention it requires. Um, it's not a sexy topic uh, like file systems, which can be sold at much more profit. It's not profitable material as such. Um, and it's not as um, big as obturation systems and um, mechanical systems are on the market. So it's very important to, to touch on irrigation because it's such a, an important pillar of endodontic therapy. So the broad topics today that I'm going to be covering is challenges in um, irrigating the root canal system, the ideal properties of an irrigant solution, sodium hypochlorite and its advantages and limitations, how do we activate the sodium hypochlorite? Why, when, and how? We'll touch a little bit on the smear layer and EETA. Why is this so important? We'll touch a little bit on uh, chlorhexidine and endodontics, the role of calcium hydroxide as an intracanal medicament, and a little bit on the side effect of irrigation uh, has on the tooth as a subject. So if we go right to the beginning, uh, root canal treatment, um, occurs as a result of uh, bacterial development within the root canal system. And to really eradicate this, um, we really need to reduce the bacterial load from the root canal system itself. And by doing that, we can then allow some sort of healing to take place. And we do this by two forms, by using instruments and um, by antimicrobial solutions. Um, and this is really what the challenge is. Um, if you look at this slide of a, uh, an unprepared surface of the root dentine within the root canal system, you can see the bacterial biofilms, uh, the cocci that's within it, uh, which is sort of engulfing the dentine tubules and going deeper within the dentine tubules. So this is what we're, what we're up against. Um, and it's very difficult to really eradicate this from the whole root canal system. We can never really sterilize the tooth. All we're trying to do is disinfect it as best as we can give the body a fighting chance to actually get rid of any infection at the end or the apex of the tooth itself. So what are the roots of bacterial entry? Well, you've got the classical form, which is um, caries, uh, restorative procedures, uh, fractures um, that occur as a result of um, trauma or occlusal trauma, or as a result of a fracture in the tooth as a result of a large restoration. Periodontal pocketing and therapy after uh, root surface deprivement, uh, this can occur. Attrition and abrasion, infection from adjacent teeth, uh, resorptive defects, and anachoresis, which is um, thought to be a process in which you might get bacteria from the, blood, from the bloodstream that may kill off the tooth. And again, this has never really been proven, but it's something we need to discuss. Uh, resorptive defects and anachoresis, which is... Um, now, indications for endodontic therapy, 
um, are caries involving the pulp, so pain and swelling, trauma, cracked teeth, uh, root resorption as a result of trauma or orthodontic therapy, and elective uh, root canal therapy for prosthodontic uh, purposes. So the purpose of endontic therapy really is a process of removing the inflammatory tooth uh, uh, structure within the root canal or the pulp tissue. Um, and in doing so, what we're trying to do is prevent um, a peripheral infection happening within the root canal system as a result of the bacteria and its toxins. And also by preventing that, you then prevent a peripheral infection happening. But if a peripheral infection was to have taken place as a result of chronic uh, apical the plan is really at that point is to clean the tooth as much as we possibly can, reduce the bacterial load and allow healing to take place. But as we know, endodontics requires uh, multiple levels for it to become successful. So we need straight line access, we need to locate all the canals, we need to gain patency because that doubles our success rate. Um, to have really good three-dimensional obturation so we can cover all the dentine tubules and suffocate the bacteria in a dentine so that it, they don't regrow again. Uh, removing the bacterial biofilm, this is very, very important. Irrigation, this is a pillar of root canal treatment. Irrigation, I think, is the most important element of root canal therapy. I think it's not uh, commonly discussed. Uh, removal of the smear layer, again, this is important because it unclogs the dentine tubules to allow us to physically clean within the, dent uh, the dentine tubules themselves to a certain depth. And an excellent coronal seal. If you look at Enget Health studies, could the coronal seal improve the success rate by 11 folds? So this is really, really important. And root canal therapy, like we said, is a balancing act between irrigation, mechanical preparation. But we do have challenges within root canal therapy. And I'm gonna to touch on some of these challenges. So the root canal system is a very complex and uh, delicate system. Um, it's quite intricate in its structure. It's formed of dentine tubules, accessory canals, lateral canals, furcal canals, and, and um, molars. And astomosis and isthmuses, which connect the canals together. Apical delta, which has over 98% of the lateral canals and ramifications, and curved canals, which makes root canal therapy quite difficult uh, because of its anatomical uh, difficulties. So, mechanical preparation itself helps remove the vital and necrotic tissue within the root canal system, and it creates a sufficient space for us to actually put irrigants and medicaments within the root canal system. But of course, this has limitation. The biggest limitation is that mechanical instrumentation alone can't touch all the surfaces within the root canal system itself. It can't remove all the vital and necrotic tissue. And alone, it cannot reduce the bacterial load. It actually has a minimal bacterial load and effects. And most of these studies are older studies that we're looking at at the moment. So as you can see from this uh, slide on the left, you've got a size at 30K file, which is barely touching any of the surfaces in the root canal system. And this sort of amplifies the difficulties that we're having for mechanical preparation alone. You can prepare certain aspects within the root canal system, but you're left with so many areas that are completely untouched. Peters et al. showed in 2001 that over 53% of the root canal surface is left untreated or uninstrumented as a result of preparation. And this seems to increase uh, the more ovoid or flat the canals are in their anatomical shape. And if you look at this cross section of a tooth, you can see that um, it's been well prepared within the central lumen of the canal, but as you can see, the isthmus has got a lot of bacteria. And this is going to be completely untouched by your uh, instrumentation. So this is really what we're up against, areas that we just can't reach with our uh, fancy file systems. The micro CT studies have also touched on this. Again, if you can look at this slide, the red part is the area that the files can touch. The green areas are the untouched areas, and they are large. These areas um, will harbor biofilm, will harbor bacteria and their toxins, and if they're not eradicated, it's very difficult for us to get a really good outcome to only have failure down the line. Looking at this, uh, some of the studies, some have shown that uh, mechanical preparation alone will only reduce the uh, bacterial count by up to 25%. And this is, again, another slide of, an, of a part of dentine, which has been completely untouched by root canal therapy. So leaving this behind is always going to give us problems in the future. Another issue that we have is difficulty to prepare and um, clean the apical third. Now, the, if you look at this study, a famous study by uh, Nair, um, root canal treatment has been carried out to a high level. Infection never really healed. Apical surgery was carried out. And then histological sampling was taken of the uh, apical uh, third. And as you can see, there's still a lot of bacteria in its biofilm. 
So bacteria is still present in the apical third of the roots and as a result of its anatomical difficulties. Um, it's difficult to infect, to disinfect, because one, we're worried to get there again that far down, we're worried that we might get a hypochlora accident, um, and it's truly difficult to clean all the ramifications in this area. And this residual microorganisms living there will eventually cause failure. Uh, and that's why in this case, for example, the root canal treatment uh, did not work. We also create a lot of debris when we're doing root canal therapy. Uh, so when we're preparing the tooth, as you can see on a slide here on the left, you form a lot of shaving, dentine shavings. And these are, it's a bit of a problem leaving this for a number of reasons. One, it can increase instrument, uh, instrumentational mishaps. It prevents the irrigants actually getting to the right area. You're clogging up the root canal systems. So your irrigant can't actually get down to the apical third. The debris that's left has got residual biofilm, and, and this debris could be extruded through the apex, causing post-operative uh, symptoms and pain, and inflammation. And all of these things may potentially cause uh, a negative healing outcome. So it's important, again, the importance of removing the smear layer. And again, I'm going to touch on this later on in the presentation. So what's the role of the irrigant? Well, irrigants are, have an antimicrobial effect depending on the irrigant you use. They penetrate, penetrate the dentine uh, tubules. They um, allow you to treat areas that have not been touched by the uninstrumented surfaces. It prevents packing of the root canal system with debris, so you're constantly flushing everything out. And it removes the organic and inorganic debris, which this smear layer is formed of. So the irrigant plays so many roles in root canal therapy. So what are the ideal properties of um, anodontic irrigants? It needs to be bactericidal, so kill the bugs. It needs to be germicidal, kill the, um, um, and it has to be fungicidal to kill the fungi or, or the candida. This is more so in root canal treatments. Um, acts as a lubricant. Uh, it has an ability to dissolve the organic and inorganic tissue. Does not irritate the apical tissue or affect healing. Acts in the presence of blood and exudate, so uh, pus, for example. It removes the smear layer, can penetrate the dentine tubules, doesn't stain the tooth. This is obviously very important for anterior teeth and doesn't affect the mechanical properties of the tooth. We don't want to be doing all of this treatment to really sufficiently weaken the tooth to the point that it does not survive. So we need to be careful and cautious about that too. And like I said, the importance of irrigation is, is it's not just about choosing the right irrigant. Like I said, there's so many challenges involved, such as the anatomy of the tooth, the organic and inorganic component uh, formed as a result of the mechanical preparation, the biofilm, which is very difficult to penetrate. It's incredibly complex in its system and the smear layer that's formed that's going to um, technically block all the uh, dentine tubules, and this may affect our outcomes. So the most the irrigants that we have commonly in endodontics is the sodium hypochlorite, uh, chlorhexidine 2%, and the EDTA. There's also other irrigants out there in the market, such as MTAD and QMIC, some of which are uh, penultimate irrigants instead of EDTA. HEBP is, um, is a newer irrigant that is uh, designed and formed out of editrionic acid, which is a substitute to EDTA. Again, we don't have a lot of long-term studies for this, but it seems to be a kinder material uh, than EDTA on the dentine. And there's still a lot of clinicians that are still using saline. And saline alone will remove the, uh, will reduce the bacterial load, but only on the bacteria that's floating freely within the root canal system. Anything that's attached on the root canal system is going to be, it's not really going to be dislodged by the saline. So sodium hypochlorite is the irrigant of choice, uh, and it's the most commonly used irrigant. Um, it's an alkaline solution of pH 11. Uh, it's antimicrobial and bactericidal, uh, so it completely kills the bug. It doesn't allow it to reproduce. It's effective against dissolving pulpal collagen and organic tissue. This is very important because that's what the pulpal tissue is formed of. Uh, so it's important that this gets dissolved. Again, like we said, the mechanical preparation will remove a vast majority of the uh, vital tissue that you can, or necrotic tissue that you could physically see with your naked eye, but there's going to be elements of it that's completely uh, been left in areas that, you know, obviously the file cannot uh, retrieve. Acts as a lubricant, so always, always use the sodium hypochlorite within the uh, canal as you're preparing. Um, and this does a few things, it, you know, uh, it gives you a lubricant effect, it cools down the file a little bit, you don't want to be using it in a dry canal where you can then put too much friction on the dentine, too much friction on the file, cause a file fracture. Sodium hypochlorite, the issue with it is it can't remove the inorganic smear layer, so it can't remove the dentine shavings. It has no substantivity, so it doesn't uh, have this ability that chlorhexidine may do, and it has no, uh, and it can't, and if it goes through the apex, you, you know what the consequences are going to be, a caustic burn um, and bruising, and we're going to discuss that in a moment. 
the nice thing about sodium hypochlorite, it works very well with calcium hydroxide, so it helps to remove further tissue. And with EDTA, it removes the, or inorg uh, the organic element within the smear layer. So by using it together, you're going to get the removal or the complete removal of the smear layer, which we're going to touch on in a moment. So like I said, the limitations are the biggest worry that we always have is um, a sodium hypochlorite accident. And how do we prevent this? Well, pre-bend the, the needle, two millimeters short of your working length. So, so make sure you've got a really good working length using an electronic apex locator. Uh, double check your measurements throughout your treatment. Make sure your irrigate, your needle is uh, two millimeters short uh, or sometimes three millimeters short of the apex if you're worried. Use a lower lock syringe with a side bending needle. So, um, so the irrigant comes up one side rather than downwards towards the apex. Use your index finger, don't use your thumb because it has minimal force. Um, constantly keep moving the needle, don't wedge it into one place or leave it in one place and keep irrigating. Uh, and don't wedge. What I mean by that is don't stick it into the canal and then it's stuck. And then when you're irrigating, the irrigant can only go one of three ways, either down, through the sides or up coronally. So you don't want to be doing that to create too much pressure and then you get irrigant coming out of the apex causing a problem. So keep the irrigant, uh, you know, the irrigating needle constantly moving. Now I get questions uh, questioned a lot as to whether um, sodium hypochlorite, we can improve its efficacy. Well, the, the simple answer is we can, and that can be done with three ways. Time and concentration, they sort of work hand in hand, temperature and activation. And we're gonna to touch on that right now. Um, concentration of sodium hypochlorite, it comes anywhere between 0.5 and 8%, depending on the country that you work in. I know in America, they have it at 8%. In the UK, it's 5.25. Uh, we know that a concentration of 0.1 to 1% and higher concentrations work equally to reduce the bacterial load within the root canal system. If you're going to use a higher concentration, we have studies to show that it may be more effective against E. faecalis and Candida albicans. This is very important in root canal treatment cases where we know that the success rate is always dropped. We're trying to, you know, we're always on the back foot. We're trying to clean the canal as much as possible and throw as much things in it as possible to actually get a better outcome. Uh, in vitro studies, so test tube studies have shown that 6% sodium hypochlorite was actually good at, against the bacterial biofilm. So the bacterial biofilm is incredibly strong. It's a tough membrane and the biofilm 6% seems to dissolve it and get into it and penetrate it. But whether or not this translates into the actual root canal system itself, we don't know. So what are the, how can we counteract if we're using a smaller percentage against a higher percentage? Well, if you're using a, a lower concentration of sodium hypochlorite, what you need to do is use it over a long period of time and keep putting a fresh irrigant within the root canal system, so what we call replenishment. And by doing that, you're going to get to the same destination as a higher concentration. Again, what does that mean? Well, if I get 1% sodium hypochlorite and I get 5% sodium hypochlorite, if I was to put pulpal tissue in two test tubes uh, and I put 5.25% in one and 1% 1 in the other, the tissue will be dissolved in the 5.25% in say two and a half, three minutes, let's say for argument's sake. But in the 1%, it might take 20 minutes. So by using the irrigant within the root canal system in a lower concentration over a very long period of time, we will get to the same position as the 5.25%. But you need to be cautious. Do you want to use a higher percentage, but run the risk that if this goes through the apex, it may cause a really bad uh, hypochlorite accident and a bigger caustic burn, more damage, or do you use a lower sodium hypochlorite uh, concentration, which you might need to use over a much longer period of time, but if it goes through the apex, it might not be as damaging. And that is the sort of um, the point that you need to sort of think for yourself whether or not it's actually worth the risk or not. So in practice, I use two to three percent, and I have done for a long time. At the dental school, we use one percent, and it's given us good good results. And and we're always replenishing and cleaning the canals throughout our treatment anyway. So it makes you question whether you really need a higher concentration if you're going to be cleaning for a long period of time throughout your preparation. So it's, it is food for thought, something to discuss, something to think about. So why do we need to constantly replace the sodium hypochlorite? Well, it's all, all to do with the chemistry. Uh, the chlorine ions are responsible for, the, uh, for dissolving the tissue and the antimicrobial effect. Now this molecule is very unstable in solution, so it's consumed within two minutes uh, within the root canal system. So the second it attaches to any tissue, it loses its effect. 
So higher concentration will have more concentration per, per ml of the chlorine ion. A lower concentration will have a lower percentage of uh, chlorine ion per ml. So what, what that means is as you're irrigating, you need more of it because you're gonna, the lower concentration is gonna attach to more of the, uh, is gonna attach to the um, tissue. Therefore, you're gonna have less of it in the solution. So if you don't have a lot of it in the first place within the solution, it's going to dissolute very, very quickly. So um, that's basically the basic chemistry of how this is working. Now, another question is, does temperature improve the uh, outcome? Well, we know that uh, increasing the temperature of a lower concentration of sodium hypochlorite immediately improves the tissue dissolving capacity. Some studies have shown that this can be uh, four times as, as, as powerful um, or four times as well. And this was shown by Cunningham's work. So how do we do this? Well, the best way to do it is really to put it in the, in, in the tooth itself because the tooth is still attached to the body and it will automatically heat up within the body temperature. And you can further heat up with sonic and ultrasonic irrigation. I don't like pre-warming the sodium hypochlorite. Uh, I don't think it's required. I think this is a, a safe way to do it by just putting it in the canal and using some uh, sonic or ultrasonic um, activation, which I'm gonna discuss in a, in a little moment. So activation of the root canal system um, of the sodium hypochlorite, why is this such a, you know, why has this become such a sexy topic? Everyone's doing it, it's all over Facebook uh, and Instagram and YouTube and, and, and everyone's buying all sorts of gizmos for it. Well, uh, we've shown, there has been studies to show that it aids sodium hypochlorite in removing much more of the tissue within the root canal system. It agitates it and makes it work quicker by increasing its temperature. It allows the irrigant to flow into lateral canals and accessory canals a little bit deeper than normal if you're just to use the, uh, your normal needle. Um, it improves the irrigation into the dentine tubules um, and some studies have shown it can go in up to 800 microns. But again, these are all test tube studies. So we need to be a little bit cautious about the results and whether this is actually happening in the mouth. Um, it agitates the fluid. So it removes some of the organic and inorganic debris, this mural layer that's being formed and improves the cleanliness of the canals. Does cleanliness mean a better outcome? We don't know, but it makes us feel better that the cleaner the canal is, by proxy, we should hopefully get a better outcome and a better obturation. So that's, I think that's where we're coming from. Now, how do we usually put irrigant in the canal? We use in syringes. Um, so uh, these are the common types of syringes that you'll find in the market. The one we all you know, commonly use is the one second from the left. Uh, and it's a 27 gauge side venting monojet needle. Most companies will sell you this. So if you go, um, you know, uh, Coltine will sell this product. M most products, if you've got catalog, will show you where to buy all this uh, material. 27 gauge means it's a 0.4 millimeter in diameter. So at the tip, it's 0.4 millimeters. Um, the problem with using just irrigation on its own without activation, without using something to actually move it, is that you form areas of what we call dead water zones. So the fluid will move inside the tooth, but it will not touch, you know, it starts to get areas in the on the walls of the tooth itself or the root canal, that fluid is not being replenished. So that area is not really being cleaned very, very well. And it's very difficult to, as you can imagine, clean to the apical third, because as you know, no canal is straight. So therefore your irrigant is always gonna, your, your needle is going to go so far down and then it's gonna naturally stop. And that's because of the tapering effect of the, um, of the preparation, as well as, uh, any curvature within the root canal system itself. So again, we have to use some sort of activation to allow the irrigant to move a little bit further down into the apical third so that we can clean the area that's actually truly got a lot of infection, especially in areas in teeth which have got uh, pedicle infections that you can see on a radiograph. So this is why this is so important at this point. And if we look at some of the studies looking at how the fluid moves within the root canal system, um, as you can see, this is a side venting needle, uh, a closed ended side ne uh, vented needle. Um, it can only go so far. Computer studies have shown that this is how the fluid actually moves uh, within the root canal system as a result of the uh, fluid put being pushed out of the needle. And as you can see on the very last uh, part on the right side, that actually you get hardly any movement of irrigation or any irrigation really going that far down into the apical third. There's hardly any movement even of the fluid in the middle third. So it makes you sort of question how well are you really cleaning? Uh, how well is this happening? How well you're sort of removing the um, tissue? How well you're killing the bugs? So this, this is why we, again, have to think about using other methods to actually help this fluid to get further down the root canal system. So how do we do this? We use ultrasonics. Um, and ultrasonics have many byproducts. Um, 
But the two byproducts that are the most important for us is cavitation, so bubble formation. And what that basically means, when you put the uh, active, the tip of the ultrasonic within the root canal system, you get a lot of um, bubbling which forms. These bubbles, when they burst, they form a shearing force. So as they burst against the side of the wall, they can cause they for, they form a force which will actually tear apart the biofilm or it starts to disrupt the biofilm. By disrupting it, it means that the irrigant can actually get into the biofilm of the bacteria and start killing back the bacteria as much as possible. It also liberates it into the root canal system, meaning we can flush it out. The other thing that we're important with is something called acoustic streaming. Acoustic streaming simply means you're violently moving the irrigant. It's a little bit like a wave in the sea. It's so violent that everything is moving around. You don't get these areas where you have the dead zones. The fluid is constantly being moved. And by doing that, we get a better outcome in the sense that we remove, hopefully, more bacteria, more biofilm, more necrotic tissue, more vital tissue, and hopefully get deeper into all these little difficulties that we discussed earlier, the lateral canals, accessory canals, the ramifications apically, and get a better outcome. And this is one of the reasons why we sometimes get apical um, lateral puffs. And this is one of the reasons why we, do, why we get this. So how do we do it? How can we do it? Well, cheaply in practice, you could do what we call manual activation. So what that basically means, let's say for argument's sake, you've prepared the root canal system to a wave one primary or a protaper X2 or a protaper F2, whatever system you use, you then use the corresponding GP point with sodium hypochlorite in the canal and you move it up and down a hundred times. That's what they say, a hundred times per minute per canal. And this is supposed to dislodge the fluid, move the fluid around. It forms like a little vacuum, which uh, moves the fluid again. Um, and then you can liberate more of the irrigant. Um, and this can be done either with the master cone or with a single cone. You can do sonic activation with, with an endo activator. Uh, this is supplied by um, Dense by Serona. Uh, so this is one way you could do it. Or you could do it ultrasonically uh, with Irisafe tips, uh, Endo Ultra from Colty Micromega, 8T uh, Ultrasonic, which is the Ultrasonic X, I think it's called or something. So these are all very good systems in the market uh, that can move things very well for you. And this is what manual activation is by diagram. Uh, use a master cone or a single cone uh, of the final file that you've used. Uh, try to grab this two to three millimeters short of your working length because you don't want to be pushing sodium hypochlorite through the apex by accident and causing a problem. Move the GP in and out 100 times per minute. So you're trying to do it relatively quickly. And it's a really cheap way to do this in practice. It doesn't cost any, cost any money. And some of the studies are showing it's as effective as sonic and ultrasonic activation with some papers. So it's something that you can use in practice and it won't cost you anything because you already have this uh, material in your surgery. Now there's a little video just to show you how this uh, sort of works. Um, so this, uh, this preparation was done. And with a set tweezers, you're just basically moving the GP point up and down, up and down. And you do this maybe 100 times, 50 to 100 times. Irrigate with fresh irrigant, and then do it for another 100 times. And you do that three times. And by doing that, hopefully, you've removed a lot of the debris, hopefully uh, allowed the fluid to move, um, and get a much cleaner canal, which hopefully may translate into a better outcome. Activation of the irrigants, like I said, you've got the sonic and ultrasonic. So on the top left, you've got the sonic activation. So uh, this is the, end, the um, endo activator by Dense by Serona. Uh, it comes in the different plastic tips. I like this, it's one of my favorites. The reason why I like it is because you've got um, measurements on the side of the plastic tip. It doesn't really ledge your canal, it won't snap, it's made out of plastic. So it's quite a safe way to do it uh, with um, safety in mind. Then you have other systems like the one in the bottom right, uh, bottom left, which is the um, Irisafe tip. This is basically like a, it is like a K file, but they've removed the um, uh, flutes. So they've removed the cutting ends of it. And by, by moving this around in the canal, you will get a little bit more debris removal. It's a bit more violent in the movement of the fluid and you get more cavitation, so you get more bubbles. So hopefully then you're, you're trying to dislodge more of the debris uh, and get rid more of the uh, biofilm. Endo Ultra is a really nice system, supportable system. Um, I have this, um, I use this in practice as well. Uh, and it's really nice, the tips can be bended. Um, it's made out of titanium uh, alloy of some form um, and it's passive, it's smooth, it won't cause any ledging for you. It's a lovely, lovely system. I actually, I use this system sometimes also to remove um, separate instruments because it's quite kind to the dentine, it's not as aggressive as some of the other uh, tips. 
So passive ultrasonic activation, like I said, you get the, you know, the figure of eight movements, that's the violent movement of the water, and then you get the little droplets, which are actually the, um, the what we call the cavitation, the bubbles. And as you can see on this slide, uh, on the right side, that um, you're getting a lot of movement of the fluid. Hopefully then you won't get any dead zones and you get a much better outcome. So with needle irrigation alone, if you look at this cross-sectional, uh, cross-section tooth with a dye study, you get a little bit of penetration of the dye into the root canal system or into the dentine itself. And if you use passive ultrasonic irrigation, you get a lot more, a lot more of the dye going into the dentine. Hopefully this is being translated within the tooth itself. I, I don't think it's going this far deep, but the deeper it goes into the canal, the more we're killing of the efecalis and more of the anaerobic bacteria that's in there that may potentially live for a long period of time. These are what we call Spartan uh, bugs. They can live under the most extreme conditions. And like I said, at the beginning of the discussion or the beginning of the uh, seminar, that we can't sterilize the tooth. All we can do is disinfect it. So what we're trying to do is just reduce as much of the bacteria as possible to get a good outcome. Chlorhexidine gluconate, um, broad spectrum antimicrobial. It's got uh, much lower cytotoxicity. Doesn't have the bad foul uh, taste and smell. It's substantive for up to 12 weeks uh, with sodium hyper with 2% uh, chlorhexidine. So for almost 12 weeks, nothing can technically grow. It's still antimicrobial. Um, and this will only happen with 2%, not with 0.12% uh, and not with 0.2%, the stuff we use in a mouthwash. That will not cut it. Um, some people can get an allergic reaction to it, so it's, it's, uh, it's wise to ask the question before you use it. The evidence is that 2% is better than 0.12%, uh, 0.2%, as you can imagine. And the reason why that is, is because at 2%, it's bactericidal, it kills bugs. At 0.12% and 0.2%, it's bacteriostatic, it prevents bugs from actually reproducing. The problem with that is that then you have a bug that can't reproduce, but it can be eaten up by another bug, which then gives it energy and fluid. So you want to get rid of this. You don't want, you want to get rid and kill, off the, kill the bacteria. You don't want to keep bacteria behind as a substrate for other bugs. The other limitations is it has um, no action in the smear layer. It doesn't really have any tissue dissolving capacity. Um, and it's not really a great irrigant. It's, it uses in endodontics are very, very limited. And if you interact that with sodium hypochlorite, so if you take chlorhexidine, and sodium hypochlorite, and you mix it together, you get PCA, it's an orange formed substrate. Um, and this substrate has been, um, uh, has been said to be carcinogenic. So uh, it's important that if you're going to use both together, have a, uh, an interim uh, saline flush. So between two, both irrigants have some saline fl flush in between use. The smear layer, so as we clean the tooth with um, rotary instruments, we form areas um, which have the smear layer. We form smear layer, which is debris. And smear layer is 0.5 to 2 microns thick, so it's not very, very thick, but, and it constitutes of dentine, pre-dentine, biofil, and pulp preeminence. The problem with it is, if you leave it behind, it, it really clogs up your dentine tubule. So if you look at the, at the picture that I've got on the, on the right-hand side of the slide, the area coating the top is the smear layer. That smear layer, as you can see, is actually going into the dentine tubules. Uh, this then prevents uh, our irrigant getting into that area, it, get, it completely clogs us up. Um, it means we can't disinfect as well as we want to. It prevents you to obturate to length. Sometimes when you can't obturate to length or you find that your length is not where you've prepared, it's probably because you've got some smear layer. It's a little bit like Turkish coffee. You know, when you have Turkish coffee, at the bottom of it, or Greek coffee, at the bottom of it, you've got the thick sludge of coffee. This is the smear layer. If you have that in the root canal system, it's going to block you. It's not going to allow you to actually obturate the length. And it weakens your bond. So if you're going to put a post and core in there in the future, again, that's been clogged up. So you can't get the sealer or the bond into the dentine to form any form of um, mechanical retention. So again, important to remove this. So how do we remove it? We, we use EDTA. Uh, it's a, an excellent lubricant. It helps in definitely in sclerotic canals, it removes the smear layer. And if you combine it with sodium hypochlorite, it has what we call a synergistic effect. They work together. They're very good at removing um, the smear layer because the smear layer, like I said at the beginning, is formed of organic and inorganic debris. You, you, you have to use both to actually remove both elements within that smear layer. So together they work very well. And this is what the smear layer um, does when you use uh, EDTA. 
it just unclogs the whole uh, vintage reference. So my protocol for irrigation, um, I after I've done all my preparation, my papering, um, I'll do sodium hypochlorite uh, for 20 seconds per canal and uh, with an ultrasonic uh, tip, so uh, endoactivator or something similar. So again, like I said, 20 seconds per canal with the endoactivator, I'll do it three times per canal, and then I'll flush it with EDTA and leave that for two to three minutes. Then I'll do one final rinse with sodium hypochlorite and, and um, uh, either an ultrasonic tip or a sonic tip, like at the end of the activator, like we said, and I'll do that for another 20 seconds, and that's me finished, okay? So you don't really need to do much more than that. You don't want to do more flushes with sodium hypochlorite because it causes problems, and I'll discuss that in a second. So as we said at the beginning of the lecture, if you do mechanical preparation on its own, you reduce the bacterial load by 25%. With chemomechanical preparation, it's said to be as high as 75%. Again, these are all in vitro studies, uh, microbiological studies. Again, we need to be questioning some of these studies. Some of them are quite old studies. Um, and we still have limitations in the way that we do bacterial sampling. So it doesn't mean that this really does correlate in real life. But I think it makes sense. The more we clean it, the more we wash it, the better our access is to the apex, the more we feel that we're getting a much better outcome. So I think that makes sense. We'll do a little recap on um, intracanal medicaments, so um, calcium hydroxide. Calcium hydroxide does, has two effects, a physical effect, so basically prevents bacteria from physically growing, um, and it destroys the bacteria by limiting its space in which it can actually physically grow by, by removing its substrate. The most important element is that, it's anti, that it's, its antiseptic potential, which is a pH 12, very little things can actually live in a pH 12 environment, and the most important element is it inactivates the LPS. The LPS is formed as a byproduct of bugs when they shed or when they die, and it's the shell wall of the bugs. This seems to cause a triggering of the body to form cytokines and pro-inflammatory uh, pro markers to cause inflammation when this is seeped at the end of the tooth itself. So um, calcium hydroxide is fantastic at neutralizing this and hopefully then reducing um, uh, potential of a flare-up. When is it indicated? Well, it's indicated when your canals are wet, such as you still get bleeding, pus, um, or weeping in the canals. Resorption, um, so again, you put it in there to hopefully reduce the uh, resorptive defect or uh, resorptive um, uh, mechanical process. Trauma, uh, apex, apexification, again, we don't really need it anymore because we've got biceramic materials such as MTA and putty. So this is gonna, this has now become superseded. Direct and indirect pulp capping, again, same thing again, we've now got biodentine and a lot of biceramic sealers out there in the market that uh, seems to do a very good job uh, and much better uh, than calcium hydroxide. Sealers, again, not so much. And the most important time really is when you don't have enough time to obturate. If you don't have enough time to obturate, use calcium hydroxide, come back to it with a fresh pair of eyes and do a good obturation. When would I address the root canal system? Well, I'll address it if there's um, pus or um, uh, exudate discharge when I can't physically get the canals dry. Um, sometimes when you're doing re root canal treatment, you will find black GP and a really nasty smell, malodor. Um, that's because you've got quite a lot of bacteria in that system. And sometimes I like to put calcium hydroxide because I want to throw as many antimicrobials in there as possible to get a good outcome. If you've got a large periapical infection, again, I'm a little bit worried that I'm going to obturate in the same appointment. My only worry is a flare up. If the patient was to have a flare up, there's nowhere for that pressure to go other than a facial swelling. And I don't think a patient would be very happy if um, they developed a facial swelling straight after a root canal treatment. So if I've got a big lesion, uh, I'd like to prepare it, wash it very, very well, uh, make sure I've got patency, and um, I'll put calcium hydroxide in there and I'll leave it for two to four months to kill as many bugs as possible. And if they do have a flare up in that moment in time or within a few days after it, then we can always easily go back in, wash it, dress it, and, and temporize it again and keep an eye on it before we obturate it. And that will give patients a peace, peace of mind as well. If there's a sinus, um, usually I'm not so worried. I would, I'm happy to obturate because if, like I said, if you get a flare up, there is already a portal of exit. That exit is the sinus. However, if it's anterior teeth, some patients might feel a bit apprehensive about you obturating with a, with a spot, essentially. So to keep them happy, put calcium hydroxide, wait a couple of weeks, two to four weeks, sinus hopefully will go away, 
Uh, and then you'll know for certain that when you're obturating it, the patient will feel a little bit more reassured. Remember, if the sinus does not go after uh, pressing it with calcium hydroxide once or even twice, you need to then suspect that there's potentially cracks in that tooth. And that is why this is not healing, okay? Um, so calcium hydroxide can be quite good for sometimes as a diagnostic tool. Trauma, again, after trauma, you're always worried about uh, resorption, uh, where the cementum has been damaged on the tooth and the bone starts to eat away into the tooth itself, melting it. Calcium hydroxide has been shown to hopefully reduce this biological response. So by using it, you're trying to hold it as much as possible and get a better outcome for the tooth. And if you don't have any uh, time for obturation, sometimes you might have a very difficult root canal treatment where you just start struggling to find in canals, struggling to get the working length. Um, sometimes put some calcium hydroxide in there, come back to it in two or four weeks with a fresh pair of eyes and voila, things are always better for you. And how does it work? It neutralizes the inflammatory process. It's an alkaline. Inflammation is, an, uh, is acidic. You get a base reaction. High pH burns the tissue, cauterizes it, so it stops the weeping, and it allows to form formation of bone because you're giving it calcium as a calcific barrier. And when you're trying to use calcium hydroxide, try to use, um, I try to use what we call a navy tip on the bottom left. This is a little tip that can go to the full length of the tooth itself. It comes in different uh, lengths and diameters. Um, and as you can see, these are two reroute canal treatment cases. The GP has been removed. And this is calcium hydroxide that's been put through across the whole length. I'm not so worried about using calcium hydroxide and having a little bit coming through the apex, um, especially because I, sometimes I feel it's, it may potentially allow the body just to get an inflammatory process and start working on things to heal. Obviously be very cautious if that's next to the inferior alveolar nerve, the maxillary sinus, uh, or the mental nerve. So again, be cautious. Now we've done all this preparation but what does this all translate in the sense that, you know, what is this doing to the dentine? Is everything we're doing at the moment causing any problems to the dentine? Will we get a bit good long-term outcome based on what we've just done? You know, has the irrigants got any, um, does it cause any collagen depletion, damage to the collagen itself? Well, we know that irrigants such as sodium hypochlorite and EDTA together uh, can cause issues. Solvents can uh, form issues such as um, chloroform, calcium hydroxide, and bacterial toxins. And I'm gonna go through that in one stage at a time. What do we mean by uh, degradation of collagen? It means that the collagen within the dentine tubules or the dentine itself or the surface of the dentine reduces its elasticity. And when that happens, then the fracture resistance of that dentine is reduced. Now, as we age, this is happening naturally to us anyway, um, and it's not something we can stop. It means that there's a reduction in resistance of the coronal dentine to fatigue cracking and propagation. So as we're, as we're aging, the dentine itself is changing anyway. But if we're throwing in things like um, EDTA and sodium hypochlorite, this causes another problem, which we call dentine erosion. So to explain this in, in really simple terms, the dentine is actually covered by a hydroxyapatite layer, a layer that protects the inner dentine. When you use EDTA, that layer dissolves. So now the collagen um, is now exposed. When you use sodium hypochlorite, that causes the collagen to collapse on itself. And this is what we call dentine erosion. And this can happen at 20 to 30 microns in thickness. And what does this translate into? Well, we're not quite sure what this translates into at the moment, but we know that it weakens the dentine and tooth structure. It may reduce the bond strength and it may increase vertical root fracture from the apex. So we have to be quite careful about what our arrogance are doing. And to demonstrate this, this is, um, the dentine after EDTA has been used, and you can see the dentine tubules are nice and round and ovoid and large um, and uniform in shape. And when you use uh, sodium hypochlorite straight after it for a period of time, you could see you could see that the dentine tubules are collapsing. The quality of the dentine looks roughened. It's it's having some form of chemical damage. So we don't want to be doing this over a long period of time because the damage can actually affect how we obturate. Uh, how much sealer is going to the dentine tubules, how well we're actually closing the dentine tubules. Uh, so this is a very important element. Calcium hydroxide, like we said, it prolongs, we, we, we know through a lot of studies, through Andreas' studies, that the prolonged uses can cause degradation of the dentine matrix. Uh, this might make the dentine more brittle, reduces the fracture resistance and increases the risk of fracture. 
So I wouldn't really use it for more than four weeks uh, as an intracanal medicament. So finally, is the take home message, we're almost reaching an hour now. Um, the, there is no gold stand, standard irrigant currently in the market. However, sodium hypochlorite is the closest that we have. Mechanical and chemical preparation go hand in hand to give you a better outcome because they sort of both complement each other. They work on each other's weaknesses. Sodium hypochlorite, like we said, is the best antimicrobial agent we have at the moment. And this can be improved by using uh, uh, disinfectants. Um, sorry, activation of, of the sodium hypochlorite is very important after nighttime instrumentation because it removes the vital and the product tissue and can kill more bugs. Constant replenishment over a long period of time, uh, aided by activation, is key for uh, the sodium hypochlorite to work well. And EDTA is a penultimate rinse is very important in removing the smear layer to allow a final rinse of sodium hypochlorite to penetrate the dentine tubules. Finally, I'd like to say thank you to uh, Dr. Uh, Shahab Ramid for inviting me on the London Dental Academy webinar series. Uh, I hope this uh, presentation has um, helped some of you guys answer some of your questions about irrigation. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions after this. Um, and you can always find me on Instagram or Facebook and ask me any private messages if you wish as well. Um, and again, thanks so much for listening and um, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Amar. Very impressive. Very good. Uh, excellent presentation. Well thought of. All the steps, all the tips in endodontics, especially in irrigation, being explained very nicely and very thoroughly. Let me um, just look at some questions coming from the audience first. And then we will probably, I'll throw a couple of questions myself, Amar, if you don't mind. These are, these are difficult questions. These are the most difficult. <laughs> <laughs> I'll not ask technical questions, but just something to do with our safety sure. service and uh, service provision. Uh, question here saying, is there any evidence to show EDTA <coughs> uh, to ultimate the uh, rinse increase success rate? Um, as a penultimate rinse, you mean? Uh, but we're, we're not saying that it increases the success rate. What we're trying to say is that by proxy, if we were to remove the smear layer, which is the mud that's being formed in the root canal system, and then unplug, um, you know, unblocks the dentine tubules, meaning that we can get more of the sodium hypochlorite into the dentine tubules themselves. And therefore, if we can do that, we can then kill more bugs and therefore have a better outcome in the long run because we're killing the bugs that are sitting much deeper in the dentine tubules that can live in much harsher conditions. So if we can target these uh, anti, you know, these bugs, then by proxy we're going to have a better outcome. So yes, I think we would get a better outcome with the EDTA. In terms of the clinical practice and the practical uh, practice, Amar, in your and uh, hospital practice, what's the protocol you follow uh, before operation? Now um, you get to the working bank. Um, yep. You finish your all me chemical mechanical debris, you dry the canal, you get the MAP, and you get the X-ray, you're happy. Yeah. You X-ray straight away, or would you do anything different before? Uh, so usually before I've taken my working length uh, radiograph, I do two things. I'm actually irrigating for a good 10 minutes with sodium hypochlorite and activating it. So that's 20 seconds per canal um, and replenishing it, meaning I'm I'm, I have two needles, uh, one that I will use to remove the old uh, sodium hypochlorite in the canal and then yeah. I put fresh sodium hypochlorite in the canal and I'll do that for a long period of time. Then I will dry the canal and use EDTA yeah. and I will keep the EDTA in the canal as I'm taking my working length because by the time you've taken your working length, you've got your nurse to get your ex, that's two minutes, okay? And then finally, I do one last rinse with sodium hypochlorite for about 30 seconds to a minute and I activate with um, an endoactivator and then I dry and I'm finished. So the last okay. one is going to be sodium yes. hypochlorite in your... Um, yeah, so the hypochlorite is the last one. I don't use anything else. How does that fit with the evidence? You just uh, you talked about uh, EDTA, sodium hypochlorite. This sort of synergy might not be the best combination in terms of the from a academic point of view, rather than from clinical. Sure. Point of view. Um, I think this. If you look at the studies, it was I think his name is Gregatoris or something like that. It was a it was a test tube study. Uh, it was only if you used it over a minute that it started to cause all of this dentine erosion. So if you used it within twenty, you know, thirty seconds to sixty seconds, you were okay. If you kept going for minutes upon minutes, that's when the damage started to happen. And the downside to it is not only just, like I said, the BRF, but you might not then get the sealer to go where you want it to go, deeper into dentine tubules, because the dentine tubules have collapsed. Very similar to composite, really, and your primary adhesive. Very similar to principle, really. 
All right, Ahmad, there's another question probably out of the remit of this uh, webinar, but uh, let me just throw this question, probably you can shed some light on uh, this. Um, does the patient age have an impact of the anterior tubules in the canal? And if yes, uh, does this influence the urgent use or the protocol use? I think it's a very good question, Ammar. It came to my mind yeah. like, just for this reason. Uh, and it's good to, if you can just clarify, what's your protocol for elderly clot calcified canals? Well, I mean, like I said, um, there's some studies to show that as we age, the dentine itself becomes a little bit more brittle with time. So naturally, um, it's going to become less resistant, less elastic to chewing and the masticatory forces that you're having. So this in its own might cause problems for patients down the line that they might get cracks and micro cracks in the tooth. Does it change my uh, protocol? Yeah. And mm -hmm. unfortunately not so much because I'm still trying to do the same thing, which is trying to get as least bacteria as possible. If this is happening already, there's nothing I can really stop it to begin with. So I'm already on the back foot. I'm trying my best to help uh, the patient as best as possible to retain their tooth. But it's something in the back of my mind that it may potentially weaken the tooth a bit more. But this is multifactorial. We can't just put it down just to the arrogant. You're having to put it down on a lot of things. How big the restoration is, how, how they bite, their occlusion, whether there's already pre-existing cracks in the tooth itself anyway. There's a lot of things that will play into that. So we can't really pinpoint that this is only the factor that's going to Definitely. cause the damage yeah. and the loss of the tooth. Uh, adding to that, Amar, probably the dentine tubules might not be open as uh, such, might not harbor as uh, bacteria as they do in younger patients. And also, yeah. Amar, a question from my side about the apical third of the canal. Sometimes is, well, some studies showed the dentine tubules are not as deep as in the coronal mid third. So, how does that um, fit in the irrigation protocols we follow? And how was the impact of not having reached properly to the apical third? The problem with the apical third is the apical third, as we, we know from Bertucci's work, that they have almost 98% of all the lateral canals and ramifications. This is why when things fail, we always chop the first three millimeters of the apex while doing apical surgery. Um, for your question, I think trying to get sodium hypochlorite as far down as possible and trying to use some irrigant, um, sorry, to use some activation as close to the apex as possible might be the only way we can actually physically kill as many bugs and and get into the ramifications. We do have other problems that also happen at the apex, not only just the, um, the smear layer formation, but you've also got the vapor lock pheno phenomenon as well, where you have micro bubbles forming at the actual apex, preventing anything actually getting there in the first place. So that's where your recapitulation is incredibly important throughout the whole process of your root canal therapy, because that seems to show that if you've got patency and recapitulation, you're constantly removing some of these bubbles. Um, uh, just before we finish, there's another question, Amar, probably is not related to your topic today, but if you can as well um, give us some information about your opinion about the um, um, Wave 1 and Gold uh, reciprocation and instrumentation in general. What's your opinion about these two systems? And that's what she's talking uh, about. So rotation versus re reciprocation, you mean? I think that's what I understood from the question, saying, uh, what's your opinion about Wave 1 Gold and reciprocating in instruments in general? I think... Uh, both okay, complain, but you can. Um, I think the reciprocating files are quite safe files. Yeah. Um, I think they're great files. I, I mean, I like it. Wave One's my favorite system. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I really enjoy Wave One as a file. And the reason why I like it is for two reasons. You don't get as much of the torsional fatigue, i.e., the file will not gauge and then snap as it would with a rotary instrument, where if you don't have really good glide path, it could actually become like a screw in the wall where it goes down, it screws itself, the motor at the top still whirring around and at the bottom it's stuck and it, it snaps. From an endodontist viewpoint or someone who's got a lot of experience, the rotary instruments are a little bit better because they give you better tactile sensation. So once you know how to use them well, you know where you are in the canal, you know if it's cutting, you know when it's not cutting. With reciprocating instruments, unfortunately, you'd lose the tactile sensation. All, you're basically relying heavily on the file to do its job and you don't get that feedback any longer. Um, so I usually use a combination of two things. I usually use uh, rotary instruments as my glide path file, and I'll use reciprocating for my finishing file. And that way I know I've got to the working length, I'm happy with it, I recapitulate and get my working length again, and then I use my reciprocating file because it's quite quick. 
and there's studies to show that you don't get as much debris extrusion with reciprocating files as you do with rotary instruments. So I, I like that as well. Well, you know, it's case specific. I think we have to have some bit of dynamic in terms of our choices, our treatment planning, what system is suitable at that stage and so not for, stick to one system, to one protocol. Exactly. So for a curved canal, for example, I would never really use a reciprocating instrument. Although it seems to be through a lot of the older studies that, you know, watch winding is the best for curved canals. Yeah. I wouldn't use a wave one and a curved canal because that's going to snap very, very quickly. Okay, so like I said, I hybridize. I don't use one system from start to finish. I might use three different systems in one root canal beam. And can you tell us about your experience with the ultrasonic um, type of um, activation for the irrigants in the root um, I actually... For myself, I always a bit concerned about the safety of the tips and especially if you don't um, carefully and if you don't have the right set for the machine. Absolutely. So if you look at the studies, for example, um, you have to be very careful when you, where you place your tip of your ultrasonic uh, irrigant. This is very, very important. Now, we know the studies through dynamic motion of fluid that the movement actually continues three millimeters past the tip of the irrigating, uh, of the ultrasonic tip. So you don't want to be taking your ultrasonic tip all the way down to your working length. This is going to cause you a lot of problems very, very quickly. So work three millimeters short. Um, and keep using it for 20, 20 30 to 30 seconds and replenish. I like the, uh, I personally, I like the endo activator because it's got a plastic tip. I know that's not going to gouge my root canal system. It's going to go around the curve relatively well uh, without too much issues. But I know as well at the same time, it might not cause as much activation as your ultrasonic tip. So is it removing as much of the debris or moving or working your irrigant? I'm not so sure, but if you look at all the studies, even manual irrigation or activation with UP points seems to show as good a success rate as anything else out there. And we've been doing root canal treatment for the last 40 years without really activating till the last maybe five years. And a lot of these teeth have been doing very well for that period of time. So is it only activation alone that's causing the success? Cleanliness might not mean success. It might just mean that it looks shiny and nice and it makes you feel warm inside that you've done a good job but it doesn't, make, it doesn't mean that it's going to translate to a better outcome. So we have to be very cautious about what we're, what we're doing. Indeed, indeed. It's a big difference between cosmetic RTs, RCTs and effective RCTs. Exactly. Um, uh, I think just I just dropped the uh, CPD certificate for everybody in PDF. Could you please just download it from the chat box? Uh, is a chat message sent to you if you can download it. And in the meantime, because I put a one hour and a half, we uh, were planning to finish at eight o'clock. I threw a couple of yeah. questions. So sure. uh, one of the questions, I know some of these specialists and people, uh, working colleagues uh, in the practice, they do worm uh, sodium hypochlorite um, systematically when they do uh, their endodontic treatment. And you yeah. mentioned about the impact of temperature and time and activation on our arrogance. Yeah. Uh, you are not very keen on um, warming the sodium hypochlorite. So I don't know what's your intake on this subject and whether is there any evidence to suggest that warming to certain degrees, whether 37 or 38 or 40 degrees, will not be uh, as effective as we thought. The, uh, my only issues, like I said, it's always about risk versus benefit. So uh, the tooth already is in body temperature anyway. So it's already, you know, once you put the irrigant in there, it's going to get to body temperature very, very quickly. Irrigating it uh, or using ultrasonic irrigation shows that it can maybe go up by another, up to another 10, 10 degrees. You don't really want to be going any further than that because you then worry about the chlorine ion seeping through the dentine tube and getting into the PDF. And yeah, uh, this is going to cause you a lot of problems. So um, I'm almost trying to mitigate the risk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, Emma. Go ahead. Hello. Emma, can we go again back to your answer, please? Um, I said that the, the tooth itself is already in body temperature. Um, once you put the irrigant in there, it's already in a, in a basin, which is going to be at body temperature. So you're already, irrigate, you know, you're already increasing the temperature automatically. The second thing is most of your irrigants are going to be in room temperature anyway at 20 degrees. So you're not going to put it in a fridge because that's going to take a lot longer for it to work. Uh, the third thing is, yes, the irrigant will work better with a higher temperature. But yeah. also remember that the surface tension of the irrigant is actually going to decrease. So it means it's going to be runnier and may potentially go through your apex. So you have to be very careful from that point of view. And lastly, if you over activate it, so if you activate it, it might go up to 10 degrees more than your body temperature. But over that, you might get the chlorine ions seeping into the PDL. That's when you're going to get some real problems. So you don't want to also be doing that. Like I said, it's always about risk versus benefit. You don't want to take things too far. 
we know that the lower, uh, lower concentrations when heated are as effective or four times or more effective. And a lower concentration can be as good as a higher concentration. So you just need to, uh, you know, um, get the temperature increased by a little bit, not by a lot. Okay, so it doesn't need to be 100 degrees, you know. Indeed, you have to keep it seriously. Um, there's another question coming from uh, one of our colleagues here. It's out of the limit of this uh, subject, but talking about the file system. What's your file system which you prefer in curved canals? Uh, curved canals, you need to be very careful. It's about the procedure, how you do the procedure. So um, I'll always do my access cavity. I'll create a, a straight line access as far as getting close to the curve, but not to the curve washing that very, very well to remove any debris, bogs, uh, getting myself dislodged. Go down with a size 6K file, 8 file, 10 file. You have to go through the motion. You, you That's want to put any My preference here is hand filing, basically. Uh, yeah, hand file, 6, 8, 10. I get very comfortable yeah. with it. And then I like using uh, Wave 1 um, glider, uh, Wave 1 gold glider. It's a phenomenal file, reciprocating file um, by, again, Dense by Seronum. And then I get that to the working land. I wash very, very a lot. Um, and then uh, in this case, I like using something like a high flex file from Cool Team 2005. Uh, yeah. You want to use a narrow, a small, a, a small taper as possible. Indeed. Um, Indeed. So I like, you know, you don't want to use a big chunky file. That's going to mm -hmm. cause a lot of problems for you, especially legend. So you want to use a small file. So I like using something like um, a high flex, which is a 2005, 2005 uh, and I will finish at 2005. And I'll just do a lot of GP pumping uh, at that point. So basically, make sure that your hand file is very loose in the canal, as very. big as you can, till size 15 if you can, 20 if you can, yes. and then you've got your gold glider. Or, By the way, gold glider is a reciprocal file, so it's quite... Yes, uh, yes it is, it's very, but it's incredibly flexible. So it's a really nice file for this. Ma, um, I think again, um, let's talk about the concentration of sodium hypochlorite. You mentioned about your protocol, I'm not sure whether Liverpool or Glasgow, you <coughs> had for was 1%. Don't you think... Yeah. It's, bit low in terms of concentration especially we are busy practitioners we we know um, what we're doing grown-up practitioners and we need to make sure that patients will or oh, the, the infection will heal as soon as possible and i don't well, spend all the time uh, in terms of irrigation if i can i mean if that's possible um, <clears throat> especially in my practice i do a single visit whenever i can as yeah well. uh well per, well liverpool dental school you need to remember we use one percent for a number of reasons the biggest of which you're, you also have undergraduate students that are working. Right. So, okay, so that's across the board for postgrad and yes. undergrad. Yeah, so it's across the board. It's the protocol of the dental school to prevent as many as little accidents as possible. Um, but at the same time, don't forget you're irrigating constantly throughout the whole procedure. So my procedure is a one and a half to two hours long, and I'm constantly irrigating after every file, after every motion, after every K file, oh. rotary file. I'm constantly irrigating. That irrigant is working a lot. So I'm using that irrigant for over two hours, uh, if you think about it, in and out, in and out. So I don't, I don't feel I then need to use a higher concentration because that irrigant has been working a lot throughout that, you know, that treatment modality. I use 3% in practice. The only reason why I, I use it is because um, for me personally, I sometimes struggle to find some canals. Uh, I use it for diagnostically finding things um, such as um, uh, you know, missed anatomy, yeah. champagne yeah. bubble test. Um, but at the same time, I feel 3% is still kinder than using 5%. Um, and I'm, again, using that over a long period of time. Um, I'm pretty certain I've got my... It doesn't only come down, like I said, to the irrigant. It also comes down to the procedure. You need to make sure you have a good working line. You need to make sure your cleaning is close to the apex as possible. You need to make sure that you're, um, uh, you've got patency. There's a lot of things that not just the irrigant in this respect. So I know that I've got all, all the first three and then I'm irrigating for a long period of time and then I'm using activation, which is causing it to become uh, warmer. So it's probably working as effectively as four or five percent. So I'm, I'm doing everything to the best and most optical uh, motion possible. So I'm confident with my lower percentage that I can still get a good outcome. Omar, what's your advice for our younger colleagues in this group or uh, in general speaking who are um, hearing us and watching us about in terms of labeling the syringes when you work in, in a setting, a little bit is not well set for specialists in the dental I, practice. I, I, uh, myself, I'll just tell you from my experience, I always, before I start, the setup is quite sensitive in terms of the yep. kit, in terms of the setup, ergonomic setup as yep. much as I can, and nurses as well to brief them yes. uh, uh, before starting the session. I'll get like five, 10 minutes briefing, which I think I find it very useful in terms of yes. the gadgets and gears you use in the dental. So what's your advice? 
Uh, my advice is um, get some Sharpies pens from your local stationery shop. So get three different colors, uh, blue, green, and red. I use blue. So on your syringe at the top, at the bottom of the syringe where you're gonna put your uh, index finger, color that in in blue and color a part of your, um, uh, you know, some of the, uh, the top of your irrigant with blue, you know, the bottle itself and also the cup. Um, and then put that next to the actual cup itself. Uh, EDTA is green, chlorhexidine is red. And then I know by just looking at the end of it, what I have, the nurse will always use that same cup and it'll, she'll always use the same irrigant or syringe. So I know if she's missed giving me the wrong irrigant, I can always look at the end of it and I'll know roughly what it is. Okay? And I keep them spaced apart. So the, each one is far away from each other so that there's no mistakes. You know, the sodium hypochlorite is close to her, the ETA is closer to me. Happens with us many, many times where we ask which is the sodium hypochlorite, which is the EDTA, which is the saline, and if they, yeah. if they start smelling and actually the, and testing and looking at the color of the elegance. <laughs> yeah, put a little bit on your glove and taste it. <laughs> <laughs> we had many <laughs> surprises and it's quite, it, it happens, it happens, Amar, in, in, in the best. Well, my, one of my nurses recently mixed, uh, used, took some of the old sodium hypochlorite and put it in the EDTA bo uh, bottle. The whole thing turned white. The whole thing and had to be thrown in. It happens, it's normal. Human the error happens, it does as happen. long as it doesn't happen in the tooth. And the reason why I asked about the concentration, now most of the commercial products coming probably 3% to 2%, uh, yeah. So uh, I don't trust, I wouldn't say I don't trust, I don't like anybody to dilute for me because when I asked about dilution, I said, what did you do? So just to put a cup of water on the top of that uh, water, um, uh, syringe and I just mix it together and gave it to me, to, to you. Um, so uh, what sort of percentage, 50, 50, 100? Uh, I've, I've, so I've no idea. I'd, the reason I'd I'd think, I'd to have it yeah. neat as it is coming from the manufacturer rather than giving yeah. it to the nurses or to anybody else, one of the assistants to dilute it on the, uh, on the, day, uh, on the day of the treatment. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, to be honest with you, you need to remember from a CQC point of view, you're, you have to use CE marked products now. So you can't use, say, for example, Milton's 1%. That's not going to work. So I think just buy it from the manufacturer and use it from the manufacturer. Don't, do you don't have any, to be do we have in the market 1% uh, sodium hypochlorite? Um, as far as I'm aware, the only, the only one I know is Milton's. I think it's 0.5 or one. But right. I, I think the rest is two and three percent. So, uh, yeah. no, I don't. I can't think of anyone at one percent. Excellent, Amar. Thank you very much indeed for your time and for putting this pleasure. presentation, excellent presentation together. Thanks so much. You took us through the whole process from the academic, clinical, and the tips at the end was really useful. And very much hope that Amar will come back again, uh, hopefully within a couple of weeks' time to talk about the, the, your subject, your preferred subject about the, uh, I would say, the, um, the mechanical preparation of the root canal system, about the file system, and to go more, a little bit more commercial, I wouldn't say commercial, but just to look at the outlook of the uh, available uh, files at the moment in the market. We have got wide range of uh, reciprocatory files, and if we can get like one hour uh, talk or webinar in the near future. That yeah, sure. That'd be my pleasure. No problem at all. Thank yeah, you very much, great. Omar. And just to remind you, um, guys, there is a, a talk by my humble myself on Thursday uh, on the fixed removal option for the rehabilitation of edentulous patients. So I'll talk about the rehabilitation with conventional full dentures and then going to the implant over dentures and then to the fixed implant uh, bridges. And I will talk to about different uh, applications of the implants in terms of the number of the implants, the indications, and the upper and lower jaws and some protocols. So please, if you don't mind, join me on the Thursday, 7 p.m. and I promise you will finish by 8 p.m. and hopefully uh, all of you can make it uh, on Thursday. And thank you very much indeed and have a safe and nice uh, evening. All the best. Thanks a lot, thank you. Thank you very much indeed.